I want to show this afternoon by evidence coming from the UNC that for narrow political gains and for the purpose of the election campaign, the UNC decided to use the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago to illegally and unconstitutionally suspend the leader of the opposition from the parliament. It decided to use its majority in the parliament in order to get a political plan to campaign for the next general elections. The partnership government has not shown that it understands that there is a distinction between the party and the government. There is a line. The party and the government is not the same. And what the partnership government has been doing, it has been using government resources, state resources, your resources, the resources of the people for campaigning for the next general election. Elections. I have in my possession a letter dated the 19th of May 2015 from Rienzi Complex, Southern Main Road, Coover, Trinidad. It is addressed to UNC supporters. It said, Dear UNC supporter, I would not read the whole letter. I want to read the first part and read to you who it was signed by, signed by the General Secretary of the United National Congress, Dave Tanku. The letter in the first paragraph states, and I quote, we will shortly face one of the most significant elections in our nation's history. It is a straightforward choice between a stateswoman with a record of delivery or a man suspended from parliament for misconduct. UNC letter. It clearly showed that the agenda for the government in suspending Mr. Rowley in clear violation of the standing orders of the parliament for that matter to be first determined by the privileges committee was in order for the UNC to have food in order for it to go to the electorate. This is a clear misuse and abuse of parliament, of the use of parliament. I want the country to understand that what the partnership government has done is that it has created a precedent for the future that a partnership government, if elected, can use the parliament not only to get rid of the leader of the opposition, but of all opposition MPs. This is the road to a one-party state in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, the road is clear that if the electorate decides to choose as the next government of Trinidad and Tobago the partnership, we can have the entire opposition being suspended and we can have a one-party state in Trinidad and Tobago. Because whenever a prime minister decides to use her power in the parliament by using her majority in the parliament, to take away the right of the leader of the opposition to be in parliament to scrutinize the government is an attack on democracy and the rights of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. 
The next point I want to talk about is the runoff bill. Now, you remember that when that runoff bill was introduced, there was no consultation with the opposition parties, there was no consultation with the population, and I am on record as saying that the purpose of that runoff bill was for the government to attempt to steal the elections in Trinidad and Tobago. I also stated that that bill was a bill which it intended to kill the minor parties in Trinidad and Tobago, if I use that, dis that particular description. The bill was debated in the parliament. The government did not listen. It had intended to go through with the bill. And then what happened? It decided to postpone debate on the bill. It did not say it was not going ahead. It did not say that it was going to consult with the population. It left the bill there. For the eight months that elapsed, it, the, the partnership government did not consult with the population of Trinidad and Tobago, did not consult with the opposition parties. So if the government wanted to consult with the opposition and the people, it could have done so during the eight months. But the Prime Minister goes today very hurriedly in a press conference to give the impression to the population that because you have to have consultation, she is not going ahead with the bill. Well, I want to tell the Prime Minister, Madam Prime Minister, you're not telling the truth to the country. We decided that we were going to take political action, legal action, if necessary, in order to prevent that bill from being implemented. Last weekend, I mentioned publicly, which was reported in the media, that if the government proceeded, legal action was likely. And I referred to the case in St. Kitts, in which the then government decided to introduce new boundaries on the eve of a general election. And the opposition parties went to court. The matter reached the Privy Council. And the name of the case, for your reference, is Brantley and others versus the Constituency Boundaries Commission and others of St. Christopher and Nevis. And the Privy Council decided, and I want to read to you what the Privy Council decided, because that is exactly what would have happened in Trinidad and Tobago if the Prime Minister had gone ahead with that bill. The Privy Council granted an injunction to restrain the government from using the proposed new boundaries and for the elections to be conducted in St. Kitts on the basis of the old boundaries. And this is what the final court for Trinidad and Tobago said. It is the view that there was a strong arguable case that a deliberate attempt by the government, which was in control of the governing party, to prevent individuals from obtaining access to the High Court for a constitutional adjudication of the matter was unconstitutional. So we said last weekend, I said last weekend, that if the government attempted to pass this bill, the same legal principles would apply because what the government was doing was after eight months with no consultation, it was waiting for the, on the eve of the general elections to introduce a new measure, a new measure in order to change the voting system in Trinidad and Tobago and the right which people have to choose an MP and to choose a government. So when the Prime Minister said today that she was withdrawing the bill for it not to be passed in this session. She was withdrawing the bill because, as Mr. Abdullah said, that was because the people of Trinidad and Tobago were going to demonstrate tomorrow outside the parliament, legal action would have been taken and we would have got an injunction to restrain the government from implementing that bill. The Prime
Prime Minister has wasted so much time in the Parliament in debating matters which were not supposed to be debated. But the fixed date for election, she doesn't need a law for that. She could have introduced it now by showing by her conduct. Up to today, she could have said, well, I'm calling a general election on so-and-so date. But the Prime Minister is not being truthful to this country. And finally, there's a very important measure that she promised the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That measure was that the people must not only have power on election day, they must have the power every day of the five years to remove a government. We are going to pass a referendum law so that the people would be able to recall the government at any time within five years. Up to today, she hasn't said what has happened to the referendum bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Faris Alwari. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and to our viewing and listening public. I propose to deal with two matters very quickly, which ties into the roundtable statement as to the abuse of Parliament, and to just demonstrate this abuse by way of two very real and important um, aspects. The first aspect deals with the State Land Regularization of Tenure Act, the amendments proposed, the State Land or what is now called the Squatting uh, Regularization. Trinidad and Tobago will remember that the Prime Minister, in a public meeting on May 11th, I recall it is, announced to the population that all squatters would be regularized. We are advised that by May 14th, emergency meetings were held and that Cabinet had given an instruction that legislation be prepared. That legislation was to affect the law which deals with the regularization of squatters in a very simple way. On the one hand, to create areas called designated areas of squatting, identifying areas and labeling them as that within the meaning of the law, and secondly, something called a land settlement area. The bill was not withdrawn or lapsed by mistake. In fact, the government ought now to be aware, because sobriety has set in, that the bill could not pass. And it could not pass because there were inherent dangers in the bill. This amounts to an abuse of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who were invited to rush to squat under the expectation that they would be regularized and that they would have not only a deed of comfort but move on to a statutory lease which is for 30 years or a deed of lease which is for a longer period. The bill in fact is unconstitutional and it is unconstitutional because what the government did was to abridge and abuse the process by which land becomes designated land or land settlement land. And ladies and gentlemen, the law prescribes that in order for the schedule of the bill to be enlarged in the manner in which the Prime Minister suggests, she suggested that the 251 squatting sites which have existed in law since 1998, that those were to be increased to close to 800 sites. In doing that, she proposed to amend the law by simply including a new description of land. She did so on a simple majority basis, not inviting three-fifths of the parliament to approve the law. What she did not factor is that you cannot simply amend the schedule by a simple majority without looking to the process of amending. The Prime Minister had the ability for the last five years to ask the Minister with responsibility for squatting supervision to bring an order to the Parliament very simply and for the Parliament to debate the inclusion of land. But what the Prime Minister 
has not told you is that the land must be approved by the Minister of Planning as a designated area. The law is very specific. Unless the Minister of Planning designates the new squatting land as being, after investigation, something which is approved by the Ministry of Planning, it cannot qualify to be included as squatting lands. And ladies and gentlemen, that has not been done. The designated areas have not received planning permission from the Minister of Planning, and they would include private lands and public lands. And so the Prime Minister perhaps has only now realized that that bill could not see the light of day. It is also important to note that the same thing applies when the Prime Minister sought to improve the area for land settlements. Land settlements areas are also areas from which you can get a deed of lease or you can get a statutory lease. What the Prime Minister has done is not to provide land for the landless. She has instead left the landless in limbo because they would never, under her arrangement, be allowed to get land, what they would get is only a certificate of comfort which they cannot give to their families, which they cannot take to the bank, which they cannot use as security. And this amounts to a gross abuse of the most underprivileged people in Trinidad and Tobago and no country should tolerate a government who is prepared to abuse the most humble citizens of the, lands, of the land in in that way. Ladies and gentlemen, the second point that I propose to deal with very quickly in identifying how the parliament has been abused, you are now aware that the government proposed an amendment to the insurance laws of Trinidad and Tobago. There was a 2013 insurance bill which went to a joint select committee and which I served on. That bill did excellent work, that committee did excellent work and consultation. And a new bill, a 2015 bill, was produced. We, in the opposition, literally pleaded with the Minister of Finance and the government to bring that new legislation in its final form, which none of us had seen, to the Joint Select Committee to allow for consultation. The government did not listen. They tabled a bill in the rush days of Parliament, and the opposition took the position that we would abstain on the bill because there was not adequate consultation and that there may be big loopholes and jeopardy in the legislation if the public consultation was not had. And that's what we did. Nonetheless, the government continued to push for that bill to pass. And ladies and gentlemen, last night in the Senate I read out a letter coming from Lloyds of London. It is dated the 3rd of June 2015. It was sent by email to the Honorable Larry Howey, the Minister of Finance and the Economy. And Lloyds of London informed the Honorable Minister that Lloyds had written last year alone close to half a billion dollars of coverage in Trinidad and Tobago. And they specifically say in this letter, which I will pass to the media, they specifically say that it is important that Lloyds be permitted to continue provision for specialist coverage. And they said that the accelerated progress of the current bill has impeded its ability to properly analyze and respond to its provisions. They go on to say that amendments to the legislation ought to be considered. And they say that it is important to recognize that Insofar as there are excessive excess of requirements in similar territories that would that this bill would severely impact the appetite of underwriters at Lloyd's to underwrite risks in Trinidad and Tobago. Let me make this plain. The, one of the largest players in the international market, responsible as a reinsurer for underwriting major enterprises such as Petrotrin's business, such as major state ac ac assets, has written to the Minister of Finance and said, you have accelerated a bill, we have not had an opportunity to even consider it. Half a billion dollars of underwriting business, TT dollars of underwriting business, cannot 
look profitable for our underwriters and that there may be a loss of appetite. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the very reason why a responsible opposition stands in the parliament to defend the democracy of Trinidad and Tobago. Last night, the Minister of Finance said to the Senate that he had not received this email. I handed him a copy of the printout of, uh, of the letter which I had received. I had not received an email myself. I had received a hard copy letter. I passed it to the Minister of Finance and we have yet to hear what the government intends to do. This is why legislation cannot be rushed. This is why we stood to insist that the casino and gambling legislation go to a joint select committee because on an analysis analysis of the legislation, there was excessive criminalization which would allow for innocent infringement so that casino workers themselves could find themselves facing five million dollar fines and imprisonment in jail, even in circumstances where they were innocent of certain matters. That cannot be tolerated and even though hard decisions have to be taken, an opposition, if it is being true to its oath, must insist upon proper process and defense of democracy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, um, Senator al Rawi, Dr. Rowley. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much, members of the media. I just want to make two brief comments. One is that as the country's official opposition and its premier political party in our 59th year, we have no fear of any runoff, run on, roll off, or roll on. Because we are of the view that it is the citizen voting as Mr. Voter or Mrs. or Miss Voter who will determine who is successful at the polls. What we take strong objection to is a government attempting to ride roughshod over our constitutional protection to change the system of electoral processes and to introduce some kind of system which it believes will give itself an advantage and to say to the rest of the country, we don't care what you think, this is what the Queen will do. Today, the population has prevailed and we, along with others, are ready for the general election in Trinidad and Tobago. And what we expected the government to say today is that she would have dissolved the parliament and call the general election in Trinidad and Tobago and relieve us of the continuous stress that is placed on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Secondly, I want to point out that when you think all has fallen down. There is still more to fall down. You would have heard Senior Council Ramesh Muraj make mention today for the second time at a round table meeting that the government used or abused its majority in the House to evict the leader of the opposition. And accompanying that action was a correspondence I received from the Parliament saying that a number of things would happen to me in terms of reduction and removal of my privileges, including the loss of my earnings. But I was being paid in the Parliament, not as a member of Parliament by terms of salary. I was paid as leader of the opposition, a position that I hold only in so far as the members of the parliament who are not supporters of the government had chosen me as their leader. Had the prime minister the power to fire me, of course I would have been fired. But look at the situation that has developed. Virtually every week since I have been evicted from the parliament, because of a requirement of the constitution, the president had certain things to do, but to get those things done, he had to consult with the leader of the opposition. And I've been consulted on a consistent basis, and I've been discharging my responsibility as leader of the opposition, while under script from the parliament that I will not be paid. 
but I'm on the job as opposition leader. Secondly, today, at approximately 10.30, I received another correspondence from the President saying to me that I am hereby being consulted by His Excellency, who is proposing to appoint two persons to the Integrity Commission, a commission which has collapsed under the most dubious circumstances, with the most grievous allegations being made against the chairman by the deputy chairman, and for which there are two vacancies on the commission now, and as far as we are concerned as citizens, the commission has collapsed, and the existing chairman has questions to answer, and he may very well have been and is acting in conflict of interest. While that is so, I received this correspondence from the President asking for my consultation input. And by telephone, I'm informed that His Excellency is leaving the country tomorrow, which means that I'm given a matter of a few hours to respond in this very serious situation where the provisions of the Constitution are required to be met. Well, if this does not point out to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, where we have arrived at in June of 2015, then nothing will. Suffice it to say that I consulted with my legal advisors, and I've been advised that what has happened today with respect to the receipt of that correspondence from His Excellency and the notification that he leaves the country tomorrow and my suspicion that his intention is to hire people onto the commission rather than to dissolve the failed commission, that this contact and my inability to respond does not constitute consultation. I repudiate that attempt, and therefore any attempt by the President to appoint any person to the Integrity Commission between today, tonight, and tomorrow would be completely ultra-virus the Constitution and would be rejected out of hand by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I hereby publicly appeal to His Excellency to not make those appointments and to view the Integrity Commission as completely collapsed. And if there is to be confidence in the Commission and for it to be of any use to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, that a completely new Commission be constituted and that proper, effective, and legal consultation take place between His Excellency and the opposition leader. That is the position of the PNM on behalf of all those persons we represent as I hold the office of leader of the opposition. The circumstances in Trinidad and Tobago today is that all the state's institutions have virtually collapsed. The general election is due and due now. The Prime Minister must call the election now. On statement and information to the public of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly with respect to this new development as it relates to the Integrity Commission. Now, I think we have a few minutes left, about five or seven minutes, ten minutes left. So we, of course, are open to questions from members of the media. Uh, Mr. Maraj, should the Prime Minister decide not to call? election date, what are the ramifications of should she, she decide to, not to? There can be a mandamus against a court order to force her to um, call that. Could you explain so that the okay. public will know um, what you are speaking about? Okay. Where a public official has a duty under law to do something and he or she does not do it, a member of the public is entitled to approach the court in judicial review to get an order compelling that public official to do it. That is known in law as an order of mandamus. It is commanding. And if the official does not do it, there can be consequences for the official. But the election will be called. She will have to call it. Within the 90 days. Yes, thank you. yes, well, within the 90 days, within the 90 days, after the parliament is prorogued. Dissolved. 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 Yes. After it is dissolved, sorry. Yes. After Dr. Rowley, if it is the president of the to commission tomorrow, um, what, what is the next step or what can be done? Well, again, to appoint persons, 
it would be my view, as per the legal advice I've received today, that His Excellency would be acting illegally because those appointments would be made without the appropriate consultation with the leader of the opposition and therefore be improper and we would approach the relevant authorities to so determine. I trust that His Excellency would not contribute to the general breakdown of law and order in Trinidad and Tobago by proceeding in this very reckless manner. Um, this is a joint question to both Dr. Rowley and Mr. Abdul. Now, this group, as you know, was, was formed around the Section 34 issue. Now, you are aware that one of the so-called disclosures that the ILP leader said he will make is providing documents on the Section 34 fiasco to both your institutions. As of this date, has he provided such information? Well, he said that he would provide it to the respective to attorneys. Mm -hmm. All right, we have not had confirmation from any attorney that the documentation has been received as of now. Okay. In so far as the movement for social justice, MSJ is concerned. Okay. Um, Dr. Ali, do you have a response to that? Well, he did make reference to making his documentation available to PNM lawyers. Mm -hmm. I think all the lawyers in general are to PNM lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> in, in so far as <laughs> were you trained under the PNM? <laughs> in so far as they were trained under the, uh, the PNM since 1956. <laughs> However, I must say that um, I am unaware of any person holding the title of attorney of law at law who may have received such documentation. But I did also hear him say that for their own protection, they would not be made known to the public. It gets curiouser and curiouser. So. Um, we don't know where that is, but um, those are private matters and those are the interesting warfare of the UNC, which we don't pay too much attention at this time. Okay. The other thing is that given the developments today with the withdrawal of all these, the runoff, the squatter bill and all this kind of, you mentioned a little while ago that there's more to fall down afterwards. So what, what do you see is the government strategy having made this statement now? What is the next thing that they are likely to do, you think? The government is only concerned about one thing right now, and that is survival. The government is now in garbage time and is trying to see how it can manage to buy its way back into office. Nothing else matters. Okay. And in that scenario, we have no idea what the next scandal or next development will be. And, and if I could just say as well, that is why we are saying that the withdrawal or the decision not to pass the runoff bill is a victory for the round table and for the people. The government is going to try to spin it all kinds of ways. The government is going to try to say, as we said, in a market Machiavellian way that vote for them and then they will come with squatter regularization and all of these things. The population of Trinidad and Tobago, in our view, is far wiser and more sensible and more conscious, and therefore they will understand that what the government, the UNC, has been up to is using the parliament and misusing and abusing the parliament in order to win votes. But that is just not on, and our statement today cuts through all of that. To thank members of the media for coming here this afternoon to our press conference. We want to thank in particular the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who have been listening um, to this media conference um, on their radios and looking at it on television. We want to thank all of those technical persons who put together the live and made possible the live press conference. I want to thank members of the round table who are present, um, the Joint Trade Union Movement led by um, President Jeremy of Joyfees Fees Workers Trade Union, Mr. Ansel Roger, and a number of the trade unions are represented here this afternoon. The Farmers Representative, Amalgamated Workers Union, the Banking Insurance and General Workers Union, other trade unions that are present. Want to thank, of course, um, the People's National Movement led by Dr. Rowley, the Movement for Social Justice, which is led here today by Deputy Leader Dr. Roosevelt Williams, Democracy Watch, led by Anthony Cape, um, all of whom and Citizens Project Pride. Citizens uh, Spiritual. Spiritual Pride, sorry. Um, all of whom are here as members of, of the round table and other members of the round table who couldn't be here. Want to thank all of them for their continued participation in this very important process of raising citizen consciousness and awareness and standing up for what is right in Trinidad and Tobago and against the abuse of, of, of state institutions by the government. Thank you very much and have a very good and safe evening. Very good. David?
that he's trying to pay for, right? But what is more disturbing is that this press release about the appointment of persons tomorrow morning is proof that the consultation with the Office of the Opposition is a sham. Because if I have not yet replied to the request to be consulted, then clearly my input is not being taken very seriously. And now that I've said that my input is going to be one of raising the very idea of, of, of putting these people in, and my report has not gone to you, I find this very, very disturbing, and I trust that is extensive with the previous position. Okay. Is, is your concern the, the way it's being done or the person, the person that's being involved, the person that's involved to be appointed? It is the way. I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the person. It is, one, the time for consultation, Secondly, the nature of the commission that he's trying to touch up. It is the view of the PNM that the commission has collapsed, and the chairman and whoever else is there would not have the confidence of the population. And in those circumstances, if we want to restore confidence and make the commission useful, as per the letter and spirit of the Integrity and Public Life Act, the president is being implored to appoint a fresh commission. And then I'll, I'll have to look at the individuals and I'll have to go and research them to see if they are fit and purpose to be on the commission. And if before I could do any of that, the president is going to make appointments, not only would it be a violation of the constitution, but it would be a gross discourtesy to the office and the opposition. Do you expect legal action to be taken? If the, if the well, I, I mean, we are not going to take legal action for legal action's sake, but the act in itself of appointing persons without appropriate consultation would in itself be illegal and would deem the appointment spontaneous. If we we'll have to go to court for the court to demonstrate that it is so, then we'll do that. Okay? The, constitu the Constitution says any action of the President cannot be questioned in the court, but we can ask for an interpretation of what has happened so that he can be properly advised, and I trust that he will not, now that he knows what the situation is, that he will not proceed. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Not with you. <laughs> yeah. oh. 
Alright, you know what? 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 You know what?